All right, welcome back, everybody. So uh, we're back with Stefan uh, from uh, Performance Finishing Solutions, and we're not going to talk about coatings. Uh, we're going to talk about sanding. I've been wanting to have some sanding guys on for a while because um, a lot of the water-based finishes and things we deal with, it's real important um, to sand correctly. And there's just a lot of misinformation and a lot of confusing on sandpaper and all this stuff. So I thought it would be cool to do a video with a sanding expert. And uh, welcome back aboard, man. Hey, Eric. Thanks for having me, man. Very good to be here again. Absolutely. All right. So, well, let's uh, let's just uh, so that they have a background. Um, everybody knows who you are now. Um, you're getting all the phone calls. <laughs> thanks, thanks to you. Yes. And thank you. <laughs> um, so anyway, but there's a whole nother side to what you do um, that um, honestly, there's a whole nother side to this. And I think you can bring a whole lot to the table on the sanding side of things as well. So um, I'm really glad to have you on. So <clears throat> if you would give us just a little background, a short background on how you started performance finishing solutions and, and how that came to be in your background in the sanding industry. All right. So uh, we were originally called performance abrasives because we started out as a sandpaper company. And that's all we used to do. So we distributed sandpaper and tools and various items related to finishing to Industrial manufacturers, guys making kitchen cabinets, millwork, furniture, metal fabricators, metal polishing, grinding, all that kind of stuff. And over the years, I've had many, uh, many other coatings companies have called me over the years and asked me to join them on calls to some of their customers where they're having issues, they're having uh, bad finishes, or they're having adhesion issues. And a lot of times it was related to sanding. So they'd call me in to go and help them out and set the customer straight on his sanding so that their coatings work. And that kind of made the light bulb when the head go off. You know, the customer buys a dollar worth of sandpaper. He probably goes through about 20 bucks worth of finish. So I thought, you know, how am I going to grow my business? And uh, finishing was so hand in hand with what we do. So we got into the finishing game and we nice. started by distributing and then we hired a chemist and then we started developing our own and then we continued developing and, you know, we released the Envirolac line, and that's kind of how it all was born and how it came about. But to this day, Performance Finishing Solutions in, in the uh, Canadian market still sells a lot of stuff other than coatings, which is all sanding stuff, basically, and, and, and preparation and finishing mm -hmm. room supplies. So your abrasives, your tools, your brush sanding machines and masking tapes, PPE, your mask, club, spray equipment and all that stuff everything to do with getting right to the finish so yeah. performance is still very active in all that stuff so i'd be happy to share some some of our go-to everyday products that are most popular in the cabinet market these days and talk to you further about do's and don'ts of sanding and maybe put some clarification and answer some questions on different types of sandpaper and and why you use one versus the other uh, talk about wide belt sanders a little bit, uh, application issues that people run into and why it happens and what to do about it and how to resolve it and how to troubleshoot. So I'll be happy to go over anything as much as you like here. All right. Great. So well, let's start off with the million dollar question, which is why do we have all these different sandpapers? OK, we have cloth back. We have uh, film back. We have paperback um did i hit them all you hit them all the only other one would be a foam backed okay sp sponge back gotcha so now i'm a guy all i know is i put the paper on and i start sanding how do i know which one i'm supposed to choose for what application so i'm going to start out by answering the differences between cloth paper and film so cloth <clears throat> as a backing all of these products are what we call a coated abrasive so you've got you've got a backing whether it's cloth or film or paper and they put a layer of abrasive onto that surface and it's bonded so that's what we call a coated abrasive so cloth if you look at cloth like the shirt we wear it's it's very similar to what they use for cloth sandpaper it's weaved right it's a weaved product so your substrate is actually got highs and lows in it 
And when they coat grain onto that substrate with cloth, you're going to have high and low grains on there. So it's not going to be the ideal choice where you're trying to get a super flat finish. Typically, a cloth back product is used in applications where if you're using an orbital sander and you're fanging into edges and you're tearing up your paper, cloth is a lot stronger. So in applications where there's a lot of edge banging going on, a cloth paper makes sense. It's stronger than paper. It won't rip as easily, but it doesn't produce as nice of a finish as paper. Paper now versus uh, cloth being weaved, paper is a laminated product. So they actually take these fibers, they mix them all up and they make them into a, some sort of a, a pliable material and it's actually pressed. So the paper would be actually pressed in a pressing machine and the substrate of the paper, it's not perfectly flat, but it's way flatter than cloth. There's still a little minor amounts of highs and lows in it, but it's way flatter than cloth. Film being the next one, film is like microfilm. It is truly, truly flat. So film your grain, you're gonna have the most consistent grain peaks side by side, no highs and lows like cloth, and paper being a little bit in between, let's say. So in hand sanding, most guys are using paper for reasons of cost, and there's no need for cloth because they're not banging into edges. So now it's a matter of choice of <clears throat> paper versus film is usually more expensive than paper. The actual substrate itself costs more to produce, but it does produce a slightly finer finish because, like I said, all the grains stand up at the same height next to each other. With film, I find uh, it, it is in between cloth and paper from a tearing standpoint. So this is a, a paper disc with Velcro on it. That Velcro actually makes the paper stronger than your old-fashioned stick-on. But I can still tear that. I'm going to take a piece of... This is a film back product. Okay, so film, it's really hard to tear. Like, I had to really work at that to tear it. So it's going to take the edge pounding a lot better than paper alone would. When you get into the really high grits, let's say you're buffing, you're doing high gloss, and you're doing 1,200, 1,500 grit, cut out any orange peel on the surface prior to buffing, film is the only way to go. There are papers out there, but they generally make a deeper scratch because that paper substrate's not totally flat. You get the occasional wild grain that makes a deep swirl mark in your surface, and it makes it really hard to buff it out afterwards. So I find film is the, the best way to go when you're doing the 1200s, the 1500s prior to buffing. <clears throat> the other reason we're cloth and paper, you know, now I'm going to go away from hand sanding for a second, and I'm going to talk about belts. So in belts, it's cloth or paper for the most part out there. Uh, I would use cloth in an application where... Say you've got an edge sanding machine with a short belt, like a six by 108. So that belt's running around and every time it's flexing, it's making heat. Then you've usually got that metal pad behind it and you're pushing your doors up against it. You're making a lot of heat and you need the strength of cloth. So cloth will take a lot more pressure and heat before it'll actually break. So you go put them a paper edge sanding. If it's a really short one, it's, it's kind of, you got to be careful or you could actually snap the belt and break it or cloth much stronger. Same thing goes for calibrating. So when you're calibrating on a drum sander and if you want to remove a lot of material and you're putting a lot of pressure onto the belt, you generally use cloth on the calibrating heads and the calibrating heads in those cases would be a drum that's either steel or like a 90 shore rubber, a very hard rubber contact wheel. Uh, cloth is great for calibrating, but then you switch to the next head, you can go to paper after that. On wide belts, paper is probably your best bet all along, all day long. And then we can get into the discussion about aluminum oxide versus silicon carbide versus ceramic and zirconium uh, for mineral choices, the actual grain itself. Yeah. Before we do that, I want to I ask you a question. Um, so when you're talking about... Um, uh, let's go back to hand sanding first. So, if you're gonna if you're gonna do a film versus paper, is there any difference in the way that because the way they're sitting on those substrates, 
Uh, do you get a better cut with one or the other, or is it going to be about the same? Like in terms of a, like material removal, you get slightly better cut out of film simply okay. because your grains are all aligned side by side. With paper, you're going to have some grain a little higher, some grain a little lower. So film generally gives you a slightly more, say maybe a 5% difference. It's not huge. Gotcha. All right, now let's go back to the drums for a second. Now, I've experienced this, and I'm talking like little drum sanders for small shops, just a single head um, or like a dual head drum. Um cloth versus paper one of the things i've noticed with the cloth is is that a lot of times it ends up digging the scratches deeper than the paper is that because of the backing being um loose does that make it seems like it's harder to sand well if are you talking about the little solid steel drums where you wrap the paper yep. around it in a spiral uh -huh. pattern yeah. yeah okay so with your height on those machines the way you set your height on it Cloth is going to be much thicker than paper. So if you've set up your calibrating height based on a paper wrap and then you go to a cloth wrap, that cloth will probably be twice as thick as the paper. Right. So you're going to have to adjust your height. You're going to have to bring it up a little bit or you're digging a lot deeper just by nature because of that. Right. The, okay. other, the other thing when it comes to choosing a cloth, I would use cloth on that type of application all day long. Okay. Simply simply because of the strength you're you're winding it around a small drum those things are usually right about three inches or something yep. like that in diameter yep. and you're trying to tuck it into so usually you're folding it and tucking it paper when you take thick paper and fold it it tends to crack and break so cloth has got more strength especially once you bend it severely or fold it there's different types of cloth that you can use okay there's just to walk you through that really quickly. So your your most common cloth backs, you got a Y weight, you got an X weight, and you got a J weight. Mm -hmm. So a Y weight is going to be, it's actually got polyester in the actual fibers of the cloth most times. And it's very stiff. It's very, very rigid. It's not flexible at all. It won't stretch probably zero. Uh, and it's generally waterproof, like it's polyester backing, and they bond the grain to that. So that's really your coarser grits, your aggressive applications, excellent choice. Next step up in flexibility is to go to an X-weight, X-weight cotton back. So again, it's still pretty stiff, but not as stiff as the Y-weight, and it's slightly thinner than the Y-weight. But an X-weight cotton, now they're using a cotton backing and coating that. Cotton can stretch. So with heat, and pressure, cotton will stretch a little bit, where polyester will not. So when you wrap that thing, if they're not wrapping it tight, and if it's stretching at all, that paper might be actually, you never know, it might be moving and getting a little overlap going here and there right. on those little ones. And if it overlaps itself, okay, that's going to make a big mark in your panel. Yep. So, And then paper being the, the, the last choice there, uh, you, you have to go with like a sanding wide belt type paper which is uh, what we call f weight it's like 300 grams per square inch in the body of the paper it's a very thick paper much thicker than what you typically use on your hand sanders uh, they do that for strength to give that paper strength so you can use it on a wide belt sander and i've got some guys wrapping it around those small drums but most guys go to cloth for that application okay good deal all right so let's talk about the um what goes on the coating? The uh, the I know you've got like ceramic, uh, aluminum oxide, silicon carbide, um, and what else? What am I what am what am I leaving out? Uh, zirconium. Zirconium. All right. So all right. So what are we looking for with that? Why is there so many different ones? And what is what is our application really in in woodworking? In woodworking. Okay. So. Let me tell you a little bit about each mineral first. Okay. So aluminum oxide and silicon carbide are both natural minerals that are mined. They mine them. They grab these big rocks full of this stuff. They crush it up and they make it into different grit sizes. So aluminum oxide is a little harder by nature than silicon carbide. Silicon carbide is a lot more brittle. So you, you may think back to the old days when all the sandpaper out there for hand sanding used to be 
a gray color paper with a gray and white kind of look to it. Mm -hmm. That was all silicon carbide. And that was the choice of finishers forever and a day back in the old days. So silicon carbide is a very, pretend this is a grain. Silicon carbide is a pretty sharp mineral. And it's, it's very brittle, as I said. So it's fracturable or friable. So what it'll actually do is as you're using it, it'll crack. That piece will wear off, leaving you a new point. And then it'll crack again and it'll crack again. And it'll wear itself down. Where aluminum oxide is a little more blocky in shape by nature, and you've got cutting point here, cutting point here, a couple cutting points here and there from the aluminum oxide, but it doesn't fracture. It'll just slowly but surely dull out on the cutting points, and then it's dead. The difference of the finish you can expect out of them, aluminum oxide is going to, uh, it's going to be a very good stock removal tool. It's going to leave you a very nice open pour clean the pores of the wood rather than compressing fibers into the panel with silicon carbide if, if you were to use silicon carbide to do 180 sanding for example it's going to polish something like may a lot more close close up the pores a lot more and uh, polish the wood where aluminum oxide will clean and open the pores of the wood a lot better which is what you want you want to open those pores up. You want to clean the pores. You want to remove the fibers, cut the fibers out, not compress them into the wood. So when you put your stain on it, especially stuff like maple, cherry, birch, you want to get as even of stain penetration as you can. The challenge there, as we all know, is you get light and dark patches going on. Right. That's, that's because the stain's absorbing into the hardwood and the early wood and the late wood at different rates. Mm -hmm. So aluminum oxide is going to give you a better uniformity of finish versus silicon carbide. So where does silicon carbide really come into play nowadays? There's still some guys that like to use silicon carbide in 280 grit for sealer sanding because it produces a very narrow scratch and it's very easy to cover with lower density, or sorry, lower solid content top coats. So you could use a 280 grit in silicon carbide, but you couldn't use a 280 grit in aluminum oxide because the aluminum oxide is more aggressive and the scratches show up. So gotcha. general rule of thumb, when we converted, you know, when the whole industry basically converted from silicon carbide to aluminum oxides as a whole, the aluminum oxides last two, three times longer. People were liking that. They cut faster, better stain penetration. So we usually go up one or two grits with aluminum oxide versus silicon carbide. So if the guy said, I was a 280 grit silicon carbide user all my life, Okay, I'm going to give you 400 grit. I'm going to skip 320 and go to 400 grit in aluminum oxide. You'll still have the cut rate, you'll have better life, and you'll have the finish that you're looking for. So that uh, that makes sense. Differences between aluminum yeah. oxide and silicon so, carbide. Yeah. So what about the other ones that are out there? Because I mean, they sell they sell them to the woodworking guys. I mean, are they really not like you know ceramic and some of these okay. other ones are? Yeah, so with the zirconium and the ceramic. So on the hardness scale, aluminum oxide, zirconium, ceramic. Zirconium, you know, the uh, cubic zirconia diamonds, cheap fake imitation diamond jewelry we see. Well, that's zirconia. That's a cubic zirconia. So they have an industrial version of that called a uh, zirconia grain. So it's basically a synthetic version of the other cubic zirconia. So it's harder than aluminum oxide. It's generally, it, its home was originally designed for grinding steel because it's, it's a harder mineral. And generally, you don't get zirconia above 120 grit. So it's really for calibrating. It's a, it's a rough application type product. Gotcha. You don't see it on hand sanding hardly at all anymore. You don't see it in hardly any wood shops anymore. People are either aluminum oxide or they've gone all the way to ceramic. Ceramic okay. being even harder again than zirconia. And uh, ceramic has got extremely long life. It cuts a lot cooler. It doesn't generate as much heat, especially under high pressures and high stock rate situations. If you're doing high stock rates, so, uh, stock removal, ceramic is definitely the way to go. It'll cut like crazy. It'll consume less horsepower, less amp draw on your machinery. And... Uh, It'll just last so much longer, and you'll get a better finish because of that. 
the nice thing about ceramics is they too used to only go up to the 120 grit range. Now they're going up to 400 grit. Uh, 400 grit is about the highest. I think there's some 600 out there now too. There's a couple hybrids that are ceramic aluminum oxide blended together. They're trying to get uh, a little bit of a little bit of improvement without improving the cost or increasing the cost too much. The ceramic is generally twice as much as aluminum oxide, sometimes three times more. But when it lasts five, six times longer, the value proposition is there. It's worth it. So gotcha. in hand sanding, most of the ceramic now is coated onto film. So they've taken ceramic and put it onto a film substrate, kind of like this uh, 3M 775L purple cubitron 2 the alien paper as we that's uh, right discussed. so yeah this is this is ceramic but they've taken it one step further now there's sandpaper companies that are creating what they're calling structured abrasives or precision shaped grain so instead of just doing the normal crushing process and running it through all these screens to get your sizes of grit separated out they're finding ways somehow to make this grain very consistent in size and dimension and i don't know how they do that that's proprietary but yeah that's where this cubitron 2 stuff it's ceramic but it's the cubitron 2 family yeah. of ceramic it's something proprietary to 3m other people have their own ceramics as well and and then there's the generic ceramic out on the market which is your typical crush stuff gotcha so, yeah i've got a piece of this so you sent me some of this and i swear so I ran a, I ran like I don't know like two sets of cabinet doors and I'm still on the same one. So, <laughs> I haven't so, even changed it. It's still it's still working. <laughs> that's, that's, that, I know it's incredible stuff. And I tell people I say, hey, uh, I'm gonna do you a favor. You know, you buy uh, you buy 300 sheets a, a month from us, <clears> three twenty <throat> grit. I'm gonna give you a different one. You're probably gonna buy a box every two months. And you'll buy a hundred every two months instead because it just lasts forever. Yeah. And, and the yeah. other the other thing I find about it is it's got a really, really good cut rate too. Yeah. Yeah. So it's good yeah. stock removal. Yeah. I've found with that 320 grit that uh, I don't really need much more. I use that thing for a lot of different applications. I use it to prep my raw MDF. I use it to sand my primer coats. I use it to sand sealer coats on clears. It's kind of my go-to now. Yeah. But yeah, no, um, I definitely um, I'm I'm interested in um, getting some of these for my uh, my disc sander, my six inch sander. And I want to try this on raw wood as well. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I can tell you about ceramic. I'm not a huge fan of it on raw wood. Now, you can try okay. it for yourself. You can try it for yourself and see what you think about it. But in a 180 grit, for example, on maple, I have found that ceramic leaves a significantly bigger scratch for whatever okay. reason and when you go to stain over top of it 180 grit aluminum oxide versus ceramic i see swirl marks from ceramic that i don't see with the aluminum oxide it may actually have to step it up a grit or so if you go into ceramic there and see if you can get the result you want so if you were using one historically i'd go up to 220 grit or 240 oh, grit gotcha. ceramic gotcha would you say that this would be um a good choice I don't know, say you need to strip something or you got to you got to have like some heavy removal. This is more of the paper that you want to go. So maybe guys in the cabinet refinishing industry, would this be a better choice than your standard film? I, and I think I think it would work really, really well for that, especially that paper you got there has got the multi hole pattern on it. Yeah. So you can line that up with a sander that's got, you know, multi hole with vacuum. Yeah. Yeah. Put that paper on there and you can collect all the dust as you go and not make a big mess. Gotcha. Yeah, I think there's a lot of there's a lot of other options out there. You know, you need has got some excellent film product too, because called Film Tech, which uh -huh. is this blue, blue stuff, which which I also use all the time. I these are my two go-tos, Film Tech and then that 3M stuff. Okay. Film Tech, I like the, I like the finish of Film Tech way better than the 3M when it comes to stains. Okay. That's good. But enough. I like the 3M. I like the 3M stuff after you got a finish on there. I find it, it to be the the best hands down for sanding primers, paints, sealers, even removing old finish. 
Awesome. All right. Okay. So the next question is, is what is all the business with open coat, closed coat? Like, what does that mean? Okay. So what does that mean? Let's talk about uh, a 180 grit sandpaper as an example. We use that grit for for a discussion here. And if you look at every every square inch on that paper, I'm gonna I'm gonna make up a number here. It might not be 100% accurate, but let's say an open coat 180 grit paper has got 90 grains on every square inch. A closed coat in 180 grit could have 110 grains in one square inch. So it's more grain closer together in closed coat. Open coat, they spread them out more. With most companies, and I'm going to say pretty much all companies, depending on the grit, they have a graduating coat, open, sort of open, semi-open, closed, more closed, extremely closed. And it usually, in the coarser grits, they're more open. As you get into the intermediate grits, the 120, 150, 180, they get, a little less open, they're still open, but not as open as a 36 grit, for example. And then as you get up the scale in grits up in your 320s and 400s, they're still open, but they're a little bit more closed than the 180 grit, for example. And then and there's your true closed coat, okay? So open, it goes like that. The open coat products, they, they get a little tighter as they get finer. A closed coat is a closed coat, so it's always a tighter density of grain, more grain population. Closed coat, for me, I like using closed coat on 180 grit on wide belt sanders on the last head, especially when doing five-piece wood doors. Uh, your cross-grain scratches that you get from the last head in the belt, if you think, of an, think about doing a push-up in the mud, if you did it on three fingers only, you're going to sink so far in. If you engaged all your fingers, you're not going to sink quite as far in. Open coat, closed coat, think of it that way as well. So you'll have your closed coats not going to go as deep into the wood. Scratches won't be as deep because you've got more points per square inch, less depth in your scratch pattern, but less stock removal. Okay. So how would that work for like uh, if, you're, if you're not, can you, can you buy those types of belts for the little drum sanders as well? Generally, are those, uh, are, are those just are those just pretty much in the wide belt range? It's it's more so in the wide belt range because uh, in those drum sanders, they're not even a belt; they're really just a roll that Wrap, you buy, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, and, and you're generally nobody's nobody's using a drum sander at 180 grit. I don't think. I don't think you can get a good enough finish out of a solid steel drum. Like when you go into a wide belt. The drum would be a rubber coated drum and there's different hardnesses of those. Right. And typically when you get to the last head, that drum is very soft. It's kind of like a, uh, I would call it like a 40 shore, 40 durometer, which is soft like the uh, rubber eraser head on your pencil, the red okay. little rubber. So it's very soft, making that belt, again, less aggressive, more of a finishing head, not so much of a cutting head. So uh, generally you don't, you don't get into closed coat on your little grizzly or uh, whatever type of drum sander that yeah. you're okay. wrapping paper around. All right. Now, what about in hand sanding? Is there any reason that you would want either one of those in a hand sanding application? I don't even think anybody offers closed coat in hand sanding anymore. So okay. those are your light, your lightweight papers, your A weight, your B weight, <clears> your C <throat> weight, you know, uh, A being the thinnest, B being a little bit thicker, C right. becoming a little stiffer. The Festool stuff you mentioned earlier is usually mm -hmm. a C weight or a D weight. Right. You'll notice that their paper is a bit thicker. Uh, yeah. In the lightweight papers, they don't generally even, there's no such, really no such thing as far okay. as I'm aware. Closed coat out there. Okay. It's, all, it's all open or semi-open for the most part. 